before you even get to the numbers, before you even get to the behavior that's causing the the angst, might be overspending or it might be over thriftiness. Before you get to that behavior, you have to understand what is it that they fear? What is it that they need? Do they just need to be heard? Do they need to be recognized and respected? Hello, I'm Consuela Mack. On this Wealth Track podcast, Couples and Money, why it is such an emotionally charged topic and how to handle it on Wealth Track. Couples and Money. Financial problems are a major source of conflict in relationships and a leading cause of divorce. Today's guest is Victoria Collins, who has been named one of the country's top financial advisors many times over the years. She is co founder and former principal at First Foundation a comprehensive wealth management and banking firm. Victoria has also been recognized for her philanthropy, and she is a founder and advisory board member of an organization called WISE, Women Investing in Security and Education, which I have been involved with for years, and its purpose is to educate women and girls in investing and personal finance. And she has guided couples and families through this minefield and wrote a still relevant book on the topic two decades ago titled Couples and Money, why money interferes with love, and what to do about it. Victoria, that pretty much covers what this conversation is going to be about, and I am so delighted you can join me on Wealth Track. Well, I am happy to have this conversation with you, Consuelo. It's a really important one. So my first <laughs> question to you is, why is money such an emotionally charged topic for couples? Well, it's, it's complex for a number of reasons. And when you think about it, two partners who come together, they both have different backgrounds. Think about concentric circles. Each one of those circles represents an influence on their money thoughts, their money habits, their money behavior. And the first one is how our parents treated us. I don't know if this happened to you, Consuelo, but my mother said, do you really need that? I came from a very thrifty family. So it was all about money doesn't grow on trees. But another family might be totally different in what they're saying. And then you have the community and you have the schools and you have the media and you have everything else. And then your lifetime experiences as you go. So, of course, you come together with your partner and you're going to have differences. It's not at all unusual to have money differences or, or conflicts. It's not at all unusual for that to happen. What is unusual is that not everybody can figure out how to handle it. And there are some specific things that, yeah, that you and I want to talk about today because there are certain things we can do to make things a little bit better. But first, we under, have to understand where it comes from. I do want to tell our audience that you have a PhD in cognitive psychology, which was extremely unusual, and it probably still is in the financial advisor community. And everything that you're saying really relates to what you bring to the table. A lot of couples, either one or both, feel that money is a very private conversation and they don't want to have anyone else second guessing what their decisions are about spending or saving or investing. I mean, how do you overcome that reluctance? As a wealth manager dealing with couples for more than 30 years now, I recognize that when they come in, they bring two portfolios, really. They bring the one that we can lay out on the table and see their net worth statement, balance sheet, uh, uh, cash flow statement, tax returns, you know, all of that paper information. But they also bring their own portfolios. And you could call it baggage. Right. <laughs> These are all the feelings that you have. What can be done about it? When a couple is seeking financial information, they can have a meeting ahead of time. In fact, I, I strongly suggest having regular meetings. 
even once a week if you're a newly married couple and having just kind of a check-in with each other. And then when you're preparing to go to a financial advisor, I strongly recommend both both parties go. That's extremely important because when you hear it with a professional in a conversation, it makes a difference and it brings it home. And it, it's also an opportunity for you to express your feelings and your thoughts and what's bothering you. Now, that doesn't always happen. I've seen situations when the couple goes home in the car and then they have their private conversation. The decision might come out totally different from what we had just decided in the meeting. Another thing I suggest is that couples actually write down agreements that they make in black and white and both sign it. And it can just be the two of them. It's very helpful because in writing something down about, say, you know, we agree that if you're going to spend more than, say, $200 or $500, whatever the amount is, we're going to talk with each other. And the thing is, Consuela, things don't get any easier the richer you get. People think, well, you know, if we won the lottery, then we wouldn't have any problems. Wrong. <laughs> actually, the stakes just get higher and the problem is more baffling. Right. And, you know, actually, financial life can be harder to talk about than sex, which is that, so interesting to it me. It is so interesting. And again, that's where your psychology PhD comes in. For some reason, it's the last topic that is off the table uh, for a lot of people. How do you even start the conversation if you have one partner in particular who is not willing to go there, to actually have the conversation about his or her finances? And no matter what age, this is a very common issue. So how do you break through to get somebody to the table? Is bringing a financial advisor in as a neutral role, is is that kind of an icebreaker? That, that can be an icebreaker. There are many things, many steps you can take. Actually, getting a financial advisor, I think, is, is good because, as you said, the neutrality, the objectivity, it gets it away from the subjective area. But one thing that couples can do that's so easy and so simple is to say, okay, we're going to have a conversation and you're going to talk for three minutes and I'm going to listen. And then I'm going to talk for three minutes. And in none of this are we going to blame each other. We are just going to state how we feel, not who did what. You can think of it like a business. You would have stand-up meetings every Monday morning just to see where people are and what they're thinking is and what they're working on and different things. So why not do that in a marriage, in a relationship about money? So what I'm suggesting is that before you even get to the numbers, before you even get to the behavior that's causing the the angst, you know, it might be overspending or it might be over thriftiness. Before you get to that behavior, you have to understand why the person, what is it that they fear? What is it that they need? Do they just need to be heard? Do they need to be recognized and respected? And if if individuals would, would realize that just because somebody holds a different opinion does not make them wrong, they had different experiences which shaped those opinions. It, it makes such good sense when you break it down in that way. And the problem is trying to reframe a conversation so that you take the blame out of it. Because if one person begins to argue, no, I'm not spending too much, and the other one says, well, yes, you are, and I'm trying to save, and you're spending too much, that's polarizing immediately. So mm -hmm. then 
what each individual has to do is they have to explain and firm up why they feel the way they do. So the more they argue, the more polarized they become. So you've got to find areas of commonality. And what you might do is say, let's just catch up on our finances. And then we'll go out to dinner and reward ourselves. We're going to spend this whole evening and there's not going to be any blame or criticism or, you know, try to say that as much as possible. (laughs) I'm listening to this. I'm sure that there are a lot of other people out there nodding. (laughs) Victoria. I'm sure they're saying, yeah, (laughs) is she crazy or what? (laughs) It's all how you put it. You, You give us some tools to rephrase and to cool this hot topic down so that it is an acceptable conversation right. that is not right. loaded, as you said, with all this emotional baggage that it tends to be. And that's why working with a, a, a new, somebody neutral to it right. is helpful as well if, you, if, the, if this part is, is challenging. And it is challenging, Consuelo. You know, I certainly understand being in a blended family with five children. Which you between are. Between right. us. And Mm -hmm. eight grandchildren, and we had differences in spending priorities, and do we make loans to these kids, but what about these kids if they ask for a loan? Uh, And we want to treat all of the children equally. I I do understand how difficult it is, but one of the things that David and I agreed on initially is that there would be no withholds, so nothing that's going to be allowed to build up and become a problem later on. Um, Something else we agreed to was that I would be the CFO. And I think this is kind of important. We each have different talents and skills that we bring to the table. And a lot of times it's it's the guy. A lot of times it is the guy. Right. But I'm finding that, you know, now with the internet, women are just as interested and capable as men are in managing money. So in your meeting, once you say, okay, let's talk about this and then we'll go out to dinner and reward ourselves. And so then you might say, let's make a plan. You know, what do we want to accomplish? And what do you want to accomplish? And what do I want to accomplish in three years and five years? And, you know, what are our lifetime goals? And so it honestly... Money and power, I think, are two sides of the same coin. If you're not able to communicate uh, and there's tension in the relationship, it's going to come back to haunt you at some time. What are the biggest areas of disagreement? And I'm thinking, like, right from the get-go, with two-income couples frequently— you know, what's yours, what's mine, and what's ours? How problematic is that? That can be problematic or it doesn't need to be. How do we make it not problematic? (laughs) How do do we get it so that we're all on the same page between yours, mine, and ours without feeling we're losing power? What I've identified in couples is they're basically – five different dimensions that individuals differ on. And and this is not gender-related, actually. These are individual differences. So if you picture lines, at one end is the spending, and at the far end is the saving. So couples differ, individuals differ on that dimension. They also differ on risk whether they're risk-averse or they like risk. These are five hot buttons that can cause problems as a couple tries to figure out what's mine, what's ours, what's yours. And so the spending, saving, those who like risk or those who are risk-averse, and organizational style. I, I, I spoke with one couple who... She knew where every penny was. I mean, she was so detail-oriented. She knew, 
she was masterful at it. And he, you know, it was, oh, that bill, yeah, it's about an inch and a half down on the stack of bills. So, you know, a total different organizational style. And then decision-making style. One person might be impulsive. The other person needs more time to make a financial decision and needs more information. And then the last one is flexibility. How likely are we to change? How comfortable are we with change? So, Consuelo, it seems to me, if you drew these five lines and each person put on the lines where they feel they stand, it would be kind of instructional for right, both Right, and enlightening. Enlightening. party, absolutely. What you would want to do is to take actual assets or actual decisions. You could do the, the qualitative way. You've got decisions in each box, like holiday gifts, for example, mm-hmm. or what kind of a trip we're going to go on. That would be a mutual decision. Now, the money for that, where would that come from? Would it come from ours? Would it come from yours or mine? Most contemporary couples do have three accounts. They have the household account through which they pay all their mutual expenses. And then they each have their own separate accounts that are, that are useful for whatever they want to do individually. And again, the bottom line is communication. Have conversations about this as much right. as you can. Should they be completely transparent about how they're spending their individual accounts, the my account and your account? How do you handle that so that there's not resentment or suspicion in each individual's account? Trust is really important here. If you have any doubts or you're not comfortable, so maybe it's the beginning of a relationship and you haven't really had the time to observe that person and how they truly behave. But I honestly think that individuals should be able to spend what's theirs on what they want and not have to be and not have to report it or accountable. However, in a good long term relationship, what you'll find is that couples tend to discuss everything. For example, if I were going to discuss something that came from my separate account that was a, a, an investment I wanted to make, I would probably run it by my spouse to mm-hmm. say, well, what do you think about it? And he's not going to have the final decision. I definitely am. But it will allow him to feel included and to know that I'm communicating and being honest and open, even though I have the agency around the ultimate decision. We're talking to Victoria Collins, a top financial advisor and expert on couples and money, other sources of conflict, debt. And I'm thinking especially about you know younger or middle-aged people who are coming into a marriage with a lot of uh, educational debt. Yes, and that can be a very big surprise and not a pleasant one Mm -hmm. after the marriage takes place. So I think it is absolutely essential to have those conversations before. You want your spouse to know as much about you that will influence your relationship And a huge debt that one or the other is carrying, student debt, for example, is going to impact the relationship. You would advise any couple that there should be full transparency, that you know what your partner is bringing into this relationship. So it sounds as if it's never too early to start if you're intending to be in a committed relationship, married or not. But yes. uh, that that you should be transparent and that they sh- that they should know about your financial status and that's a good way to start a relationship. I think it helps ensure that the relationship will be 
a good and long lasting one. You said at the very beginning that money is the cause of divorce in many situations. And if you started out with good habits about money and being transparent and having integrity around what you're doing with money and being honest about debt, debt is serious stuff in today's world and it's not to be taken lightly. You set the foundations for a long-term relationship by being honest and transparent about everything in your life. And money, unfortunately, you know, is, or fortunately, it's part of what we see, what we run into every day. Every day, for example, kids are bombarded with credit cards that they can use, whether they're in high school or college. And we're encouraged to spend more than we make. So it's normal that debt is going to build up. Every time you open your wallet or open your purse, you, you're confronted with decisions about money. That happens multiple times a day even. Yes. And so it's probably front and foremost of our lives. It would be important to be as transparent as we can be from a practical perspective. Other areas of conflict, Victoria, you just mentioned children, the decision to have children, uh, a blended family, as you mentioned, you're now in a blended family. How important is that discussion? And, and is, is there a, a better way to approach uh, the children and, and the financial responsibilities that come with children? Certainly raising children, I don't know what the, the latest numbers are. Oh, $300,000 plus or something. And so you have to be prepared for that, recognizing that, you know, children are not just nice little cuddly things. They actually do grow up and need so many things and get to be very expensive. So that should be part of your decision whether to have children. Can we afford to have children? Should we wait? until we're better able financially to have children. You know, that's what you would say in a rational world. But mm -hmm. the, the thing about money, Consuelo, and you and I have talked about this, people don't always respond rationally. And there are so many reasons for that. And again, that gets back to the psychology of money and uh, and what the messages are about money from the past. And how you communicate with children and how you rear children, you're giving them messages every day about how to handle money because you're role modeling what either good or bad financial management looks like. So they're going to pick it up from you. I had the good fortune of having parents who talked about the stock market and it was dinner table conversation. That was a, an avocation for them, not their vocation. I learned so much, and that was very unusual in my time that girls or any children were part of a conversation about what goes on in the economic world. And, and you were fortunate. I don't even know how common it is today. You, you've been recognized for a lot of your philanthropic efforts uh, Victoria, and one of them uh, is an organization that I've been lucky enough to be involved in as well called WISE, which is Women Investing in Security and Education. And the mission, which you co-founded 25 years ago, is to educate women and girls in investing and personal finance and to expand their options and inspire them to reach their full potential. And as a, a couple, you can do that as well. And that's what you're saying in being the modeling. That's exactly it. And um, there are so many things we can do, and there are so many resources that are available to us as individuals, as couples, and with access to the internet. And the younger generation is, is really far ahead of where we were years and years ago. It was actually simpler years ago, Consuela, when there were specific roles. The wives managed the money, husbands earned the money. That was real simple. 
Now there are so many complexities with wives who earn more than their spouses do, or one person comes in with far more money than the other person, and then you have children, one of whom is, say, teaching school and not making much money, and the other just formed a software company that he sold. You know, so do you treat those children equally? Mm-hmm. And they they have Good very question. different financial needs. That's why behavioral economics, I think, is extremely important because it is looking at how people think and learn. And the new generation with the digital knowledge that we have, speaking about that, one thing that happens today is we watch the stock market. And of course, it happens so quickly and we've suffered from financial loss. And this this is an area that I think is causing a lot of conflict in families. Really? You look at your portfolio in the beginning of the year, you look at your investments in your, whether it's a 401k or an IRA or whatever your investments are, and then you look at them now, and there's been a substantial loss. Yes. Now, you have to deal with that. And if you're in a partnership, do you say, well, you know, if you had paid more attention, we wouldn't be in this situation. And now how are we going to pay for our retirement? We're just retiring and now the market's declined. There are so many points of potential conflict on this wonderful journey we call life that it's important to communicate, collaborate, not blame the other person, just give a lot of thought to it. Recognize that they're probably going to go through some feelings like anger and denial about what's happened and having lost money Mm -hmm. is very, very real. And then depression can happen. But finally, you have to reach acceptance. This is where we are right now financially. What do we do? What are our best steps to get out of the situation? And what can we do with what we have now? And you know, honestly, a simple way to look at this is if you take a paper and you divide it in four, there really are only four things you need to know. Top two cells, what comes in and what goes out, the inflows, the outflows, what we make, what we spend. Okay? Mm Mm-hmm. You put that number in each one of those top cells. The two bottom cells are your net worth statement, what your assets are and your liabilities, or what do you own and what do you owe? So if you think of that and you know as a couple what the number is in every one of those four cells and are they getting better each year, year after year after year, is your cash flow going up over your spending? Is your net worth going up over your liabilities? Is that growing every year? So I think that's a simple way to look at the information that is absolutely basic. And then the next thing is to decide in a relationship who's going to take the lead. And it might be that if you're both equally qualified or equally interested in your financial might be that you switch off the role of CFO for the family, but keep the other informed. That's right. so important. You have a custom, a Thanksgiving custom with your children and grandchildren. Could could you tell us about it? Philanthropy is very important to me, and it always has been. And one of the ways that we started introducing our children to philanthropy was that just prior to Thanksgiving or at Thanksgiving time, we make available to them a certain amount of money that they can then as a family use to make donations to nonprofits or charities that they have a passion for. And so this gives them the opportunity to research, to learn about different philanthropies and to either make a donation of the whole amount to one that the family agrees on and feels passionate about, or they can divide it 
And do they report back? That's the important part. We do that every Thanksgiving. We not only make it available, they make their choices. But then the next Thanksgiving, we talk about what has happened with that nonprofit, how they feel about the work that it's done. Has it really met their expectations? And what is the mission? And are they fulfilling their mission? We talk about it at at the next Thanksgiving. Our children live in different areas of the country. And so they're able to choose their own nonprofits that are important to them. And it's such a unifying family assignment. And you're teaching your grandchildren as well through that to be uh, responsible and really be very thoughtful about uh, where they're spending their money. Yes. So they will be better philanthropists when they grow up because they will have the tools of learning how to assess, to evaluate charity and the outcomes. For previous interviews with WealthTrack guests, go to WealthTrack.com and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. In the meantime, make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. (laughs) 